across the fence, move over, Maple. New research at the University of Vermont has scientists investigating another sappy crop to keep sugar makers in the black. And later, Leonard Perry talks with an author who tells us how we can bring nature home. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Not too long ago, maple sugaring was how dairy farmers would diversify, make a little green from some liquid gold. Well, nowadays, the market for maple is robust. A half gallon of maple syrup sells for $40. But what if sugar makers could double or triple that using an existing forest resource? Well, scientists at the Proctor Maple Research Center are investigating the profitability of birch syrup. As it turns out, studying birch is not much different from the roots of maple research. Here's Across the Fences' Keith Silva. The Proctor Maple Research Center was established as the first permanent maple research facility in the United States. The scientists and researchers who began their work here in 1946 were pioneers establishing standards and setting grades that continue to impact the maple industry. Quantity. And over 60 years later, there are still pioneers working at Proctor Maple Research Center. People have been interested in trees that you put holes in and sap comes out for a really long time. So we Vandenberg isn't trying to be flip to or sassy. In fact, her latest project puts her in almost the exact same place as her scientific forebears with one big exception. She's tapping birch trees. And if that sounds a bit off, how about this? She's not even sure when to tap. We have no idea when to tap birch trees, none. It's, <laughs> it's really, there are a lot of really simple questions like that that we don't have good answers to. If maple syrup is considered a niche or a specialty product, then birch syrup is a niche of a niche of a specialty product. Out of the tree, birch sap looks exactly like maple sap. And like maple, birch syrup is used as a sweetener. And that's where these two similar saps sugar off and go their separate ways. Birch tends to be a little darker, um, but it is brought up to approximately the same density that maple syrup is. So it has a lot of the same look, um, but has a very distinct um, flavor that really, you know, is nothing like maple syrup. So it's um, really not appropriate to compare the two. They're really, you know, they're sweeteners, but they're two very, very different uh, products in themselves. So they might look a little of the same, but they, they really don't taste the same at all. Most of the world's birch syrup production comes from Alaska, and the supply is limited, which is one reason Vandenberg is interested in tapping into this market. Right now, the price for bir pure birch syrup is about $74 a quart. Um, so it's a very valuable commodity, um, both because of its limited supply and also uh, because it, it, it's very difficult to produce in general to, and pr to produce well. And the demand for it is particularly heavy in the international markets. Then there's also the local food market. It's the local chefs that really want the product. So if this really goes forward, it would really re require some work to kind of develop those markets and foster those, both of those types of markets to make sure that it's a product that people would buy in a you know, once we start producing it. Marketing birch syrup is putting the cart before the horse. Until then, Vandenberg and her colleagues need to solve the minor problem about when to tap. This tree here is, is one of our test trees. We've learned from other people who produce birch syrup that in order to get the most out of each tree, you need to tap it just at the right time. In maple, you're able to hedge a little bit, tap early, and not really uh, lose out on the, the total production. With birch, it's, it's important to get it just right. So we have a number of trees that we tap just to watch the sap flow and to see when it was really running. And when the majority, about 75% of those test trees are running, then we were able to start our experiment. So far, researchers have determined that birch sap starts to run about the time sugar maples have stopped running. The purpose of this study investigates if sugar makers in the Northeast could diversify their operations after the maple sugaring season. Sugar makers would essentially switch their taps from maples to birches.
So we are tapping a set of 40 birch trees of tappable size and a range of diameters and collecting the sap from them and measuring that sap to determine what is the volume of sap that is collected from each of those trees. And we also measure their sugar content. So at the end of the season, we can calculate the average quantity of sap and sugar that is able to be harvested um, from birch trees in our operation. So then we'll then use that average yield to do some economic calculations to determine, okay, given an operation with a certain number of birch trees and a certain functioning of their maple operation, certain equipment, et cetera, how many birch trees would you have to have in order to make birch syrup production a profitable venture? This research is funded by the Northeastern States Research Cooperative. What Vandenberg and her funders are banking on is that modern sugaring technology, like reverse osmosis, which concentrates the sugars in the sap, will increase the amount of birch syrup that can be produced. On average, the sugar content of maple sap is about 2%. Birch sap tends to be about half that, and often even less. Vandenberg estimates that it could take at least 100 gallons of birch sap to make one gallon of syrup. We really didn't have a way to make birch syrup profitably in the Northeast before. There, you know, the lower sugar content, the lower sap yields really just didn't make it, uh, you know, a winning proposition before. And so that is one of the reasons that it hasn't been, you know, the line of inquiry hasn't really been pursued that heavily before other than sort of just um, from a purely scientific standpoint, looking at why the pressure is produced and things like that. Um, so now we have these tools and techniques and technologies that enable us to say, well, perhaps we could make this a profitable venture. So, you know, all the resources that we've had developed from doing research in Maple, we're able to apply that what we've learned to Birch. This project is designed to study sap yields and correlate profitability, not make syrup. One of the hallmarks of applied science is that every answer generates 10 more questions. Like those researchers who came here in the late 1940s, Vandenberg and her colleagues are learning more than what they set out to do. We're kind of curious uh, as to exactly how and why birch trees are doing what they're doing. Um, it's a very, it's a different sap flow mechanism than maple. Um, a maple sap flow is based on a stem pressure mechanism. Birch sap flow is based on root pressure, so it develops in a different way. Um, so we are doing some measurements of the pressure inside birch trunks across the season, uh, in both tapped and untapped birches, to see how the pressure develops and um, also trying to link that with air temperature and soil temperature and things like that, so that we can get a little bit of a better handle on exactly how pressure develops in birches that will kind of inform our decisions of, okay, so if we're going to tap birch trees, when is it best to tap them, uh, how early, how late, things like that. Some of those sort of management type questions that we'll need to eventually answer a little better than we know now um, if this turns out to be a profitable venture. Oh, wow. This monitoring station, built by researcher Mark Iselhart out of a cooler, keeps all the electronics warm and dry. His ingenious efforts are being rewarded with some new data that only Mother Nature has ever known. Trees that we have wired up for pressure and temperature are giving us readings of the internal pressure in the tree. And we know from um, the literature that the tree um, can develop quite high pressure, as high as 30 PSI or higher. What isn't well known is what the pressure is in a tree after it's been tapped. So we actually have a tree, several trees wired with sensors to measure the pressure in the tree and we also have one that has a tap hole in it that we're collecting in a bucket so we're able to get really for the first time what the pressure in the tree is when it has sap flowing out of it it will be a while before the word birch gets added to the name of the proctor maple research center for now this research is strictly in the name of science it all boils down to being very curious and interested in how trees work and what they do, how they do what they do, and sometimes why they do what they do. And this is just another piece of that, another um, problem or question under that umbrella that is really fascinating to look at and investigate. 
Maybe maple and birch aren't so different. After all, each of these trees has been researched, tested, and studied for decades, and they have yet to yield all of their secrets. In Underhill, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, thanks, Keith. Be it birch or maple, sugaring season means spring is here. If you're looking to do some landscaping this year, you may want to go native. Plants native to our area improve wildlife and support biodiversity. University of Vermont Extension horticulturalist Leonard Perry spoke with an author about bringing nature home. Here's Leonard. Well, most gardeners have many flowers and shrubs and trees in their gardens, many of which come from elsewhere, but this is not always the best thing, as we'll learn today from a book we have, Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. And we're fortunate to have the author with us, Doug Tallamy from the University of Delaware. Thank you so much, Doug, for sharing a Happy few minutes with us. Happy to be here. Well, tell us a little bit more about the book. Uh, we know the title. Um, uh, the, the book covers a number of topics. The most important one, though, is, is to convince people that plants matter. Um, we, have, we have viewed one important part of what plants do, and that is that they're pretty. We treat them as decorations, but we've forgotten all the ecological functions that they have. Uh, and everywhere we manage our landscapes, we have forgotten that. And now it's such a huge area that uh, we're suffering from the lack of the ecosystem services that these plants provide. Um, this book focuses on one of those ecosystem services, the ability to maintain food webs so that other living things can, can uh, continue to exist. We, you know, we have a real drain on our biodiversity in this country because we're taking away habitat. And now the only way we're going to save these species is to share the spaces where we live and we work uh, and to a lesser extent where we farm. So this book talks about the relationships between plants, um, how they capture energy from the sun, pass it on to, to other organisms, how insects are a very important component of that, uh, which is another piece of news for most gardeners. We see insects as, as the enemy. We've got to kill them all the time. But uh, we will not exist as, as human beings on this planet if we get rid of all of our insects. So uh, we need to plant plants that the insects can use so that other things can eat those insects so that we have the other things around. Great. So it sounds like a pretty uh, big topic and a lot, but why, uh, I guess, aren't all these plants the beautiful plants we bring in? Why, why are native plants more important? Um, well, that's that, that's that insect connection again. Let me give you one quick example. Uh, if you want chickadees in your backyard, if you want them to reproduce in your yard, it takes 4,800 caterpillars to feed one clutch of chickadees through to maturity, 4,800 caterpillars. So you've got to make those caterpillars in your yard. What are the caterpillars eating? They're eating the plants that they co-evolved with. Uh, and, and most species of caterpillars, 90% of them, are really specific about what they can eat. So if we bring in plants from, from Asia, our caterpillars can't eat those which means you're not going to get your 4,800 caterpillars and you won't have chickadees. And that's just one species of bird. 96% of our birds are feeding their young insects, mostly caterpillars. So if we want birds around, we've got to change the way we landscape with, with the bulk of our plants, the big, particularly the big woodies. Okay, so not, not just the flowers, but, but the it's, shrubs and trees as well. Yeah, that is where most of those caterpillars are developing, yeah. Hmm. So it sounds like fascinating. I'm sure there's just lots more in this. What uh, brought this uh, to mind? Why did you feel compelled to and, and write this? I know you're doing some research on this area. Right. Uh, well, I, I am an entomologist, and, and I have studied how insects interact with plants uh, for a number of years. But what really stimulated this is that we, my wife and I moved to a new house, uh, more or less in the country. It's now surrounded by suburbia. but. It had been mowed for hay, and by the time we moved in, it was overrun with, with invasive species. So autumn olive and, and uh, oriental bittersweet and multiflora rose, Japanese honeysuckle, and so on. And these are all plants from Asia. And the first thing I noticed in my yard is that uh, none of our local insects were able to eat those. Um, we started doing research on this. Uh, the news media picked it up, and people started to invite me to give talks. And then people said, we want to read about this. And I said, there's nothing to read. So finally I said, <laughs> I'd write a pamphlet. And the pamphlet became the book. And that's how it is. <laughs> great. I know it's very successful, too. And I know uh, there's some great pictures in here of a lot of some of these different insects and caterpillars you're talking about. And I guess there's probably some good, it looks like a nice table here, some good take-home information for gardeners, too. Mm -hmm. We have some plant lists for every part of the country about um, what are some of the, the um, 
um, the best, most productive plants. One, one last thing to leave you with. Native is not the issue here. It's productivity because there are native plants that are very poor at supporting food webs too. So we want to focus on the plants that are good at doing that. Uh, and, and that's really just a subset of, of all of the natives that so are It's not just a black and white it's native. It's not black and white, It's no. just yeah. how, you know, what they can produce for the insects and exactly. the good stuff in here right. on that. Right. A lot of great lists. I look forward to looking at it. And uh, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about it with us. And I hope our viewers can take some time and uh, get up to speed on this as well. No, you're welcome. Thanks for the invitation. For the University of Vermont Extension, I'm Leonard Perry. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.